If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. Wait a minute. I know who you are. Yeah, but I heard you were dead. I am. The once great city of New York becomes the one maximum security prison for the entire country. A 50-foot containment wall is erected along the New Jersey shoreline, across the Harlem River, and down along the Brooklyn shoreline. It completely surrounds Manhattan Island. All bridges and waterways are mined. The United States police force, like an army, is encamped around the island. There are no guards inside the prison, only prisoners and the world they have made. The rules are simple. Once you go in, you don't come out. On May 23rd, 1981, Escape from New York hit the big screen, arriving first in Japan and then July in the United States, and from August to November it hit most of Europe. Produced on a small budget of roughly $6 million, it made $25 million in the USA alone. It is unconfirmed how much it made worldwide, but the movie was considered a success. The critics praised the film for its grimy futuristic design, thrilling action scenes and its B-movie plot. It was considered one of the best escape movies. Over the years it still received strong praise when it's revisited by fans new and old. The character of Snape Plissken has become a bit of an icon and his character has been copied and affectionately homaged by the Metal Gear Solid series, where its main protagonist is very much influenced by Snape Plissken. In 1974, John Carpenter had written the script for Escape from New York. It was created in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal and how the public felt towards their president. Also, Death Wish had just been released, and that played a part in John's direction for the script with its tone and violence. He had shot the script around to a number of studios, and they felt it was too violent and weird. Carpenter had just made Dark Star, and that totally bombed, and he feared that no one would hire him now as a director so he thought he should explore his career as a screenwriter. So he put Escape from New York aside with the intention of making it later. John managed to give his credentials a boost with the success of Assault on Precinct 13, which he wrote and directed. This led to the financing of Halloween, which became the most successful independent movie at the time. John was now hot property in Hollywood. He and his producer Deborah Hill secured a two picture deal with Avco Embassy Pictures, which led to The Fog and Escape from New York. Avco had wanted him to make a movie on the book, The Philadelphia Experiment. John instead recommended them his script for Escape from New York, which they loved. But John first wanted to spice it up and brought in his friend Nick Castle. Nick was a close friend of John's, he played The Shape in Halloween, and also went on to be a successful screenwriter and director, working on The Last Starfighter, The Boy Who Could Fly, and he contributed to Steven Spielberg's Hook. Nick brought a lot of humour to the script, and created the character Cabby and polished off the film's ending. Avco Embassy Pictures suggested Charles Bronson or Tommy Lee Jones to play the role of Snake Pliskin, but Carpenter really wanted Kurt Russell, since he had just worked with him on the TV movie Elvis. Kurt was desperate to break away from his lightweight screen image that was conveyed in the many roles he did for Disney comedies. Carpenter refused to cast Brosnan on the grounds that he was too old, and because he worried that he could lose directorial control over the picture, with an experienced actor involved. Avco eventually settled on Kurt. He wasn't unknown and could help push the box office, but another problem arose. With its limited budget, they couldn't shoot in New York. They had to find a place that looked similar, but also be run down and ruined. Filming began in August of 1980 and wrapped in November of that year. The locations manager for the production suggested St. Louis, Missouri, as it had an entire neighborhood burnt out in 1976 due to a massive urban fire. Many blocks were just left empty with not a soul in sight, so you could light a section of streetlights and see how empty it was for miles into the distance, making this small budget movie look huge. As well, John Owls, the production designer, found an old bridge to double for the 69th St. Bridge and managed to secure a giant plane to be cut up and displayed in the streets to simulate the aftermath of the president's plane crash. 
New York did appear in the film, but only for the opening sequence with the Statue of Liberty. The lighting director Dean Cundey and John Carpenter created a clever split as the camera pans and cuts to another location in LA, which doubled for the police department set on Liberty Island. A college in LA was also used for the interior of the police station. That year, Panavision had developed a new ultra-speed lens that used less light, so it made it possible to shoot scenes with limited lighting, therefore easier to shoot at night. This gave the movie a very unique look and gave the filmmakers an advantage for its nighttime shoots and settings. With the film's cast, we have Kurt Russell playing Snake Plissken. Snake is a former US Special Forces soldier, convicted of attempting to rob the Federal Reserve in Denver, Colorado. His attempted robbery was filmed, but it was deleted from the film, as the preview audiences didn't understand what was going on until he arrived at the police station in New York, so Carpenter decided to drop the scene. It makes sense to remove it, but it's an interesting sequence that demonstrates some of Snake's humanity. He cares about his friend as he sees him get gunned down. There is a long running gag throughout the movie that whomever Snake bumps into, they thought he was dead. So he has a reputation that isn't really explained. Pliskin is a self-contained and self-motivated person and doesn't want to conform to society and hates authority. Russell undertook a rigorous diet and exercise program in order to develop a lean and muscular build. The eye patch was an idea put forward by Kurt. He wore two different patches in the film, a regular one for the dialogue scenes but another which allowed him to see through it for the action sequences. However, he couldn't wear the patch for too long because it would mess up his depth perception. Music legend Isaac Hayes plays the Duke of New York. He has become the leader of the imprisoned criminals and everyone has to abide by his rules and decisions. He doesn't display much emotion and remains cool throughout the movie, making him difficult to read. Donald Pleasance plays the President of the United States. The President's plane is hijacked over New York and he escapes and finds himself kidnapped by the local prisoners and is held to ransom. Donald apparently loved making this movie, playing the President as a bit of a buffoon and was happily surprised to see a lot of comedy injected into the movie. Lee Von Cleef, the star of many spaghetti westerns, plays Bob Houck, the police commissioner. He enlists Snake to save the president. Lee Von Cleef damaged his knee years earlier and never really got it fixed, so he walks with a limp throughout the movie and wasn't too keen to do the long takes with him having to walk a great distance. Acting legend Harry Dean Stanton plays Harold, aka Brain. Harold provides the oil to keep the city alive and the cars going. He works closely with the Duke, but has his own agenda and wants to escape. The Duke needs him because of his intelligence, but the rest of Duke's gang don't trust him and believe he will turn against the Duke. Oscar winner Ernest Bognine plays Cabby who connects Snake with his old friend Brain. Ernest sadly passed away in 2012 at the ripe old age of 95. He was working up until his death. For younger viewers out there, he was the voice of Mermaid Man for SpongeBob SquarePants. Adrian Barbeau plays Maggie, Brain's girlfriend. Adrian was in the fog the year before and at the time was John Carpenter's wife. Also, Kurt Russell's then wife played a small part in the movie. Snake bumps into her during his escape from the crazies. Tom Atkins plays Remy, the police commissioner's assistant. Tom turned up in the fog and Halloween 3 season of The Witch. Surprisingly, he didn't make any more appearances in John Carpenter's following movies, but thankfully he went on to have a successful career during the rest of the 80s and into the 90s. Frank Doubleday plays the Duke's psychic Romero, named after George A. Romero. Frank also popped up in Assault on Precinct 13, but didn't return for any other Carpenter movies. His appearance and persona really gives the audience a clue as to what the people are now like in New York and sets the tone for the movie. The film opens explaining that the world changed in 1988, following a 400% increase in crime. The United States government has decided to evacuate Manhattan and turn the island into a giant maximum security prison, in which all inmates serve a life sentence. A giant containment wall surrounds the island, with armed helicopters patrolling the rivers so no one can escape. It jumps to 1997 with the President of the USA travelling to a peace summit. A terrorist group hijacked Air Force One. The president has to escape. He handcuffs his briefcase to his wrist that holds a cassette tape containing his important speech. He jumps into the escape pod and it lands in the middle of Manhattan, and the plane and remaining passengers die on impact as it smashes into a skyscraper. The US police force officers are dispatched to rescue the president. However, Romero, the right-hand man of the Duke, presents them with the president's cut-off finger. 
and warns them that the Duke has taken the President hostage and if they attempt to rescue him by any means, he dies. The police commissioner comes up with another plan. He offers a deal to Snake Pliskin, who has just been arrested. He will be sent to Manhattan in a glider and if he rescues the President and retrieves the cassette tape within 24 hours, he will arrange a presidential pardon for his crimes to ensure that he completes his mission or doesn't make any attempt to escape. The commissioner injects him with microscopic explosives that will rupture Snake's arteries within 24 hours, but that can be neutralized if he returns in time. Snake makes it to New York, landing on the World Trade Center. He locates the wreckage and the escape pod and tracks the president's signal to a theater, only to find it on the wrist of an old drunk man. He bumps into Cabby, who takes Snake to meet Brain, an advisor to the Duke, who has made the New York Public Library his home. Brain's real name is revealed to be Harold, Snake's old friend. Brain had let him down in the past, causing a rift between them. Snake forces Brain and his girlfriend Maggie to lead him to Duke's compound at Grand Central Station, where he finds the president in a railroad car and tries to free him. But the Duke has arrived with his men and Snake can't escape. Despite its $6 million budget, from how it looks, you might at first think it costs in the region of $15 million and over due to its fantastic visual effects. John Carpenter approached New World Pictures and the Stotak brothers after being impressed by their work on Battle Beyond the Stars. John wanted to push for everything to be done within camera as much as possible. One of the challenges was making the visual effects match the existing material that was shot on location. They had a limited budget to work with and achieved many of the shots in miniature form. To realize the miniature of Lower Manhattan and to make it match the real buildings, they photographed a map and put the negative on a slide projector, projecting it on the wall and traced out all the streets and buildings, in the end using plywood and cardboard to build their city. Three different scale gliders were built and a combination of different visual effects methods were used to film them, such as motion control. James Cameron, who started his career at New World Pictures, contributed to some of the incredible map paintings and the motion control shot of the president's plane. The most inventive visuals in the movie is the computer imagery, for which no computer graphics were used. Carpenter had wanted high-tech computer graphics, but they were far too expensive at the time, even for such simple animation. To get the animation he wanted, the effects crew filmed the miniature model set of New York City under black light, with reflective tape placed along every edge of the model buildings. Only the tape is visible, and it appears as a 3D wireframe animation. Very clever stuff, and they still look flawless today. For me, the matte paintings are what still impress me, seamless visuals that have stood the test of time. The name's Pliskin. John Carpenter is back with another cracking electronic score, and now in association with Alan Howarth. John has provided the score to the majority of his movies, which is extremely rare in the industry, further displaying his range of skills. Alan Howarth first started working as a sound designer, his first movie being Star Trek The Motion Picture. The editor of Escape from New York, Todd Ramsey, who had also worked on Star Trek, recommended Alan to John Carpenter. They got on really well, and it kicked off their working relationship and they collaborated on seven other movies. The theme is what most fans will remember from the film. It's simple and very memorable. The rendition of it for Escape from LA has more of a punch to it. It's not as slow and I prefer that version of the theme over the original. The score does lack big action cues. It would have been nice near the end to have something more epic, as the music's job for the film is to set the atmosphere and drive the momentum as Snake attempts to save the president and escape. It's not a traditional score for an action movie, but as a musical experience by itself, it's a great listen, perfect music to listen to while you study or work. It's also been mixed and sampled by many DJs over the years, so there is still a huge fondness for the score. The soundtrack for the film was an afterthought. It wasn't released to tie in with the movie, but the label Verez Saraban wanted to release the music and contacted Alan and producer Deborah Hill. John Carpenter was surprised they wanted to publish the music. He felt it was only intended for the film and not for easy listening, but Alan persuaded him and mixed the music and sequenced the tracks to create the album. The record sold 80,000 copies in the first six months. It was one of the biggest hits for the label. The LP was re-released last year by Death Waltz Records and only a thousand were pressed. In 2000, the soundtrack was remastered, remixed and reissued through Silver Screen Records including more tracks, with some of them being dialogue from the movie. 
which did displease some of the fans. This version is very easy to obtain and you can grab it on iTunes or get a physical release from websites such as Amazon. There were no video games based on Snake Plissken and his adventures during the 80s on the old microcomputers, but there was a game produced intended to arrive on the Xbox and PS2 in 2005, but was sadly cancelled in 2004. There are a few videos and images online demonstrating what the game looked and played like. There is no real reason to suggest why it was cancelled, as you can see it has a lot of potential. I suppose if you want to play a game as close to Snake Plissken, you should go play the Metal Gear Solid games. There was a board game released the same year as the film. It was a strategy based game which was designed for two to four players. Players attempt to locate the president and get him off the prison. Failing that, they had to find the cassette tape the president was carrying. But if you failed at that, you lose the game. The board game is very collectible, so if you want to hunt it down, don't expect to buy it on the cheap. In 1996, we got a sequel based in LA with Snake returning to save the president's daughter, a very similar premise to the first movie. It was basically a remake with not much new added. I've already reviewed this film and you can find it on my channel. I still like the film, but with its lack of new ideas, there isn't much incentive to re-watch it. I go back to it now and again, but it pales in comparison to Escape from New York. There has been discussions regarding a third movie for years and even a remake, but nothing ever got past the concept stage. Ghosts of Mars was apparently written as a third escape movie, but was later retooled to support Ice Cube. Ghosts of Mars failed financially and critically and didn't please Carpenter's fans. It does feel in essence like an escape movie and you can see the building blocks of what direction they were going with, with the third Snake Plissken adventure. In 2012, Guy Pearce starred in the action sci-fi movie Lockout. Lockout follows Snow, a man framed for a crime he did not commit. He is offered his freedom in exchange for rescuing the president's daughter, from the orbital prison MS-1, which has been overtaken by its inmates. Sound familiar? It's a movie I really enjoyed but couldn't help notice the heavy influence of Escape from New York and LA. Seemingly so did John Carpenter, who took the filmmakers to court for plagiarising his films last year. The court ruled in his favour and he was awarded 20,000 euros, the writer Nick Castle got 10,000 and MGM Studios received 50,000. Despite Lockout being a total rip-off, it's still fun to watch, and Guy Pearce is fantastic in it. It's worth watching just for him alone. Escape from New York is a movie I discovered when looking for random John Carpenter flicks after getting into his work during the early days of DVD. I had seen The Thing, Starman and Big Trouble in Little China in my younger years, but Escape from New York passed me by, and I only knew it by name when Escape from LA hit VHS, and my friend said to me it was a sequel. The DVD for Escape from New York wasn't out when I was hunting down the film, so the Laserdisc release had to make do, which didn't bother me because the picture transfer and sound was really good, and it came with the making of and commentary. Both these extra features were put on the DVD and later Blu-ray releases. The movie felt like such a novelty to me on first viewing. Having New York as a prison and a badass anti-hero with an eye patch being used as a government's pawn to save the president, it sounds like a canon films movie with Chuck Norris. It has that B-movie plot and sensibility to it. But it doesn't really fall into that B-movie category, as it goes beyond just being a schlocky cheap film. It does have a low budget, but the talented and creative people involved make it stand up against the big budget Hollywood movies at the time. Its premise of New York being a prison is very far-fetched, and I think people in 1981 would have thought this would never happen even in the future of 1988. The idea is brilliant, but I think John Carpenter could have sold it a bit more. The introduction to the movie was thrown in at the last minute to explain what happened, but it would have been ideal to show how New York had fallen into chaos with its crime and corruption, perhaps using news reports of actual riots from the time just to give more weight to the idea that New York has become a mess and could potentially be cordoned off and labelled a prison for the so-called scum of society. John Carpenter has openly admitted he hates authority and people telling him what to do. His attitude and way of thinking is displayed on screen, especially in this movie and also in They Live a few years later. So you have this police state in control and everyone must conform to their way of thinking. Any crimes that are committed, the individuals are thrown into New York and can never leave. Maybe some were thrown in for their bad sense of fashion. Many of them look like they have taken fashion advice from the Lost Boys of Peter Pan. A lot of how John Carpenter thinks is in the character of Snake Plissken. 
He doesn't care about who is president or the problems of the world. He just wants to be left alone to do his own thing. Anyone who confronts him is just another hurdle for him to get past. Now you could think he's not really a likeable person. He doesn't seem interested in making friends and is very short with people. But there is a good streak in him. He knows right and wrong, but prefers to go by his own rules. He is like the lone gunman, the cowboy who entered a town and must protect himself. People like those types of characters. Many people would just love to say screw the system and society and I'm going to follow my own rules. So as the viewer you can live vicariously through Snake. The cassette tape Snake has to secure is the MacGuffin of the story. It's never really explained what's on it or why it's so important. It's just used as a plot device. There are hints as to what it may be. The recorded speech is intended to put an end to the world's problems. It seems to indicate that it's about resolving their power needs. John Carpenter in the audio commentary just says the tape is used to get the plot moving and never explains it in any detail. So any fans trying to solve what is on the tape, don't waste your time. What defines the movie for me is its look. For such a modest budget, they really push their creativity to make it look spectacular. I think it's one of the best looking of Carpenter's films. He is a big fan of anamorphic scope and all his movies are so well composed with their shots. Due to its limited budget, they couldn't afford to do that many takes. So you have a lot of limited setups and long takes, which works wonders for the dialogue scenes and introduction of the next sequence of the story. But it doesn't really work that well when it comes to the fight scenes. The action is perfectly fine, but it's not really going to blow you away. For the time, critics seem positive on those aspects but there isn't really much to it. Snake doesn't get to use his guns that much. He is usually fleeing from the bad guys because he is short of time. When he does confront them, he takes them out quickly. Snake is efficient and takes out victims with ease, but the action is cut in a very traditional way. It lacks some speed and pace to it. The big fight in the ring sees Snake meet his match, which is a lot of fun to see. Seeing Snake take out the guy with a quick whack to the head with his spiked baton is a great finishing move. The crowd instantly start cheering for Snake and at this point Duke really loses interest in Snake after learning that Brain has taken the president. It's a shame there isn't a definitive face off between the Duke and Snake. Duke briefly talks to him when they first meet up but knocks him out and Snake gets in a quick punch up near the end and then the president takes his revenge and kills the Duke. It would have been interesting to have a scene where the Duke tries to persuade Snake to join him and trick him into thinking he can remove the explosive device if he joins him. Having some conflict for Snake and to trick the audience into thinking he may go against the police. The audience already knows Snake is self-motivated. He could turn against the authorities and go his own way. But as the movie moves along, you realise he is a good guy at heart and honours his deal to the end. If you are a fan of the film, I'm sure you probably already own it. If you want to upgrade your copy to a new version, the recent Scream Factory release is highly recommended. It has the best transfer and is loaded with extras. One extra did surprise me however, they interview the actor who was in the deleted scene and they cut to HD footage of his moments, but the completed train sequence is only available on the disc in standard definition. Seems odd they didn't transfer the complete scene. The UK Blu-ray I would avoid however, the transfer is an upscale of a DVD master, very naughty of them to do that, so it's not really in 1080p. Escape from New York is a solid movie. You have beautiful compositions and great photography. You have Kurt Russell in the lead and you know you are in for a real treat when you see him and John working together. The movie is cast well with great supporting actors. All involved deliver great performances, especially Levon Cleef. He just has an awesome voice. And despite his age, he is not a guy you would mess with. You have the electronic soundtrack to add an extra level of class to the movie. It may lack in some areas for the action for me, but with John Carpenter behind the camera, writing and scoring the film, this is him at the top of his game. There was always a great flow to his films, going from one scene to another. Everything just slots into place so well like a puzzle. You take it for granted, but it's the skill of a director who can tell a story visually. This film is classic John Carpenter. I want that diagram, Brain. Uh, it's at my place, Duke. Uh, Duke, <clears throat> that Pliskin said something about a time limit. What time limit? On him. That's a lot of crap. We've got to go in now. We hold. You're countermanding my orders, Hulk. This is my prison. I'll give the orders. I override all that. Just try. Duke, don't kill Pliskin. We need him. You 
You're not supposed to be in here, Brady. The president's gone! Brady, talk down! I knew that son of a bitch was alive. He's inside. Station 19. They spotted two cars on the 69th Street Bridge. Taxi cabin a Cadillac. The taxi hit a mine. There's four people on foot. Fourteen minutes. Get a jeep with a winch over there, fast. deal for you. I want to give you a job. We'd make one hell of a team, Snake. Name's Pliskin. <laughs> <laughs>